Hello everyone. So we are back with our second uh, lecture on ground cell tumors. And uh, we have uh, uh, just a day before International Childhood Cancer Day, we are trying to create awareness about childhood cancer. So our first lecture would be uh, by Dr. Juhi Asha, who is a consultant uh, in pediatric oncology and uh, she's working in uh, Portis Hospital Mulund in Mumbai. Uh, she is uh, trained in TMH and uh, has been has a good experience in pediatric solid tumors and uh, hematology. Over to you, Dr. Juhi. Sure. Thank you, Monica. I'll share my screen. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You can go on. So, good evening, everyone. So, the topic that Monica has given me for uh, giving me today is to uh, cover the clinical aspects of round cell tumors in pediatrics. Uh, so, as we know, that a majority of childhood cancers are malignant round cell tumors, and these are basically primitive or embryonal cells with little or no differentiation. So they are highly malignant neoplasms, also called as small round blue cell tumors. And if you see these images actually on microscopy, which Dr. Kunal will be able to illustrate more on, look like a sea of blue cells. So this is a prototype of round cell tumor where you see these small round blue cell tumors. So what are the most common uh, malignant round cell tumors in children that we encounter as a pediatric oncologist are neuroblastoma. Ewing sarcoma, which is now referred to as primitive neurectoral tumor or PNET, rhabdomyosarcoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, retinoblastoma, medulloblastoma, desmoplastic round cell tumors. And also we see these uh, typical small round blue cells in many cases of other pediatric solid tumors in uh, different uh, uh, cases. For example, in a hepatoblastoma, the small cell undifferentiated variant, which uh, is known to have low AFP and does bad, does look like a round cell tumor. Wilms tumor with the blastemal variant, a pancreatoblastoma, osteosarcoma, small cell variant, synovial sarcoma, malignant round uh, rhabdoid tumor, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, and the ETMR, which was formerly, which is a brain tumor, which is an embryonic tumor with multi-layered rosettes, and it was formerly referred to as CNS PNET. So there was a study which was done and published in the International Journal of Medical Science and Public Health, which surveyed uh, all the round cell tumors across all age groups. And they found that the highest incidence was observed in the pediatric and the adolescent age group. So the uh, most commonly it was found in 0 to 10 years of age group, followed by 11 to 20 years of age group. So round cell tumors are diseases of the pediatric age group. Male to female was, the male was predominant. I mean, it was predominant in the male population. And the most common round cell tumors in the pediatric age group that they found were neuroblastomas, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Ewing sarcoma, and rhabdomyosarcoma. So I'll go uh, through the clinical aspects of all of these four major uh, pediatric round cell tumors, beginning with neuroblastoma. So as we all know that uh, it's the child, it is a disease of the child and the median age of presentation is two years. But practically we see that this can occur at any age from antenatal life right to the teenage. Now this is an embryonal tumor of the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic nervous system. So it can arise in the adrenal medulla or anywhere right from the neck to the pelvis in the sympathetic Cervic, uh, sympathetic ganglion cells or the chain right from the cervical area to the pelvic area. So the presentation would be in the form of, uh, most commonly it would be an abdominal mass, which is incidentally felt by the parents, generally while bleeding or touching the child. And this would present as an adrenal suprarenal tumor. If it occurs for, at, the cervical, at the ganglion level, right from the neck to the pelvis, then it can have varied presentations. So if it occurs in the cervical sympathetic ganglion, it can present as Horner syndrome, which is a, a syndrome which is a combination of meiosis, ptosis, anhydrosis, and also the color of the iris on the affected side changes, which is known as iris heterochromia. If it occurs in the paraspinal region and it has an intraspinal extension, 
then the child can present with weakness of the lower limbs or paraparesis. If it's a pelvic neuroblastoma, uh, which, is which will then have mechanical obstruction or uh, obstruction to the sur uh, surrounding organs, which is the bowel or the bladder, and the child will present with anuria, oliguria, or constipation. Then we have the uh, metastatic forms of neuroblastoma, which can present with an array of systemic symptoms. So a child will have weight loss, fever, and they will have bone marrow and bone manifestations, which will be in the form of, uh, you may see like, you know, there'll be deposits in the retroorbital or supraorbital area, which will cause of the infiltration of the underlying bone, which is referred to as the raccoon eyes. And the classical stage 4S, which is now known as stage MS, will have an infantile age group or a very small child presenting with a blueberry muffin syndrome that is involvement of the neuroblastoma uh, by the, in the skin, which appears as blueberry muffins. And also there might be liver infiltration in these children and bone marrow involvement. The other type of presentation in neuroblastoma is paraneoplastic. So as we know that we have obstaclonus myoclonus ataxia syndrome, now this is also present in smaller children where it will have a very small uh, suprarenal tumor. Sometimes it's difficult to find the tumor, but the manifestations are more neurological in the form of um, rapid eye movements, muscular spasms, and ataxia. And remember, 50% of children who present with OMAS have an underlying neuroblastoma. Also, it can present as a... Uh, Paraneoplastic in the form of secretory diarrhea, which can also lead to dehydration, metabolic acidosis, known as the VIPOMA or the VDHA syndrome, which is nothing but watery diarrhea. Uh, it has uh, hypokalemia and a chloridia. So, the, the, so a neuroblastoma is a heterogeneous disease and it can, prevent, it can present in varied forms. As we know that most important clues well, you can pick up on clinical and in, on clinical examination and initial lab evaluation before we go into the detailed uh, staging and restratification or hypertension in a child with an abdominal mass. Uh, LDH, raised LDH and serum ferritin can give you an idea about the tumor load. And 90% of neuroblastomas are catecholamine secreting where uh, we'll have the VMA and the HVA raised. Coming to the second most common uh, uh, round cell tumor which we encounter is Ewing sarcoma. Median age of presentation is an older child, a teenage child, which is 15 years. And generally it presents as a palpable mass or you will have a local regional pain in the extremity followed by a swelling, which indicates that there is some involvement of bone. And 30% of patients with Ewing sarcoma can have fever. So as we know that the uh, most common presentation or the uh, site of origin for a Ewing sarcoma is bone. 80% are from the bone and soft tissue is around 20%. And uh, if we see, it's most commonly in the extremities and in the extremities, commonly in the femur, that is the distal femur and the proximal tibia. 21% is in the pelvis and 17% in the thoracic wall, which we also refer to as the askin tumors. 30% uh, of patients with Ewing sarcoma can have metastasis at presentation and lung being the most common where 15% have lung meds. Rhabdomyosarcoma. Now, uh, as we know, rhabdomyosarcoma similarly can occur in all the age groups, but the most common age group is between 5 to 10 years, uh, sorry, which is 1 to 4 years where you have 34% and the remaining is in the 5 to 9 years and 10 to 14 years respectively. And the most common presentation is in the head and neck area, where if you see around 36% is in the head and neck area in the form of paramenangeal, orbital, and other head and neck. And then you have 23% uh, in the genitourinary area, 20% in the extremity, and the remaining is others. Others meaning this tumor, although it originates from the skeletal uh, muscle lineage, it can occur anywhere in the body. Now, for our better classification and prognosis, we divide these uh, rhabdomyosarcomas depending upon the site of origin as favorable sites and unfavorable sites. Favorable meaning, is it favorable to have a local treatment at that area in the form of surgery or radiation, or is it unfavorable? So the head and neck area, the favorable sites are head and neck involving the orbit and the non-paramenangeal sites. In the genitourinary 
is a favorable site excluding the kidney, bladder, and prostate. And liver and biliary tract RMS are favorable sites. And unfavorable sites includes the paramenangeal sites. And paramenangeal includes middle ear, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, nasopharynx, pterygoid infratemporal fossa. As we discussed, kidney, bladder, prostate are unfavorable sites and extremities are unfavorable sites. 25% of these cases of RMS have distant metastasis and lung is the most frequent site where 50% have lung mets and the other sites of mets are bone marrow, bone and lymph nodes. Now coming to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, this is also a tumor in the a bit of uh, school going and adolescent age group, 5 to 15 years. And non-Hodgkin lymphoma includes Burkitt's lymphoma, diffuse last B cell lymphoma, lymphoblastic lymphoma, and anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So as we know that it basically involves the lymph nodal regions of the body. And uh, I have a figure here showing the different areas or lymph nodal groups that we categorize. Uh, stage four is when there is involvement of bone marrow and CNS. And ALCL is a typical, uh, particular, you know, typical type of uh, lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, where you do get extranodal sites of involvement in the form of skin, lung, and bone. So these, depending upon where they present, uh, and most of them are in the critical sites, like the Valdez ring, the cervical area, mediastinum, uh, the abdomen, they present as a uh, medical emergency because they are aggressive diseases. So, as I said, that if it presents in the uh, bulky cervical lymphadenopathy and mediastinal involvement, they can pre uh, present as acute airway obstruction. A mediastinal mass is how they present, and you can have superior inferior vena cava syndrome. Uh, if you have para if paraspinal or para aortic nodes are involved, then and there is CNS involvement, there can be spinal cord compression. If there is pericardial or pleural effusion, they can present as pericardial tamponade and respiratory distress. And most commonly, we have seen in our practice that Burkitt's lymphoma presents as an, with involvement of abdominal nodes as an intersusception or an intestinal obstruction. And as these are aggressive disease, they multiply fast, they have spontaneous lysis, they have a very high chance of tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, and uh, simple clues to pick up lymphomas on a routine um, clinical and laboratory survey would be a CBC and a peripheral smear. If there is stage four or bone marrow involvement, it would be obvious in the CBC and peripheral smear itself. As I said, they can present with TLS. You can have deranged RFTs and electrolytes where potassium and phosphorus are important to look at. And uh, the tumor burden is indicated by a surrogate marker, which is LDH. So higher the tumor load in the body, the LDH will be higher. Uh, there is just a small note, like this is not standard of care or something that is uh, published, but we used to use uh, subtle signs in radiology to differentiate round cell tumors in practice. So they generally present as heterogeneous mass areas with, with or without necrosis and calcification, but round cell tumor has a peculiarity to encase major vessels, which we know is seen in neuroblastoma, not only as you can see in this picture, the neuroblastoma from the right kidney, as right uh, suprarenal area above the right kidney is not is going crossing the midline, encasing the aorta, and also uplifting the aorta. Even in lymphomas, if you do an imaging, you will see the lymphoma surrounding the major vessels. So, as uh, I conclude, that yes, all these tumors, if you see them histopathologically and morphologically, they look the same. So there is an overlap and thus we need an integrated approach to diagnose them. Clinical, laboratorical, radiological and pathological diagnosis. And IHC and molecular testing is very important in these cases to know, to arrive at a proper diagnosis and hence uh, start a proper management. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Juhi. Uh, Dr. Amit, any questions you want to? Okay. I think we can take it at the end. Yeah, so we'll take it at the end, Dr. Amit, then. So uh, now we have uh, uh, Dr. Kunal, Dr. Kunal Sharma, who's Associate Director and Head Global Reference Rep and Lead uh, of Digital Pathology and AI in Initiatives in SRL Diagnostics. Dr. Kunal, over to you. 
thank you dr monica thank you dr juhi i think you've given a very elaborate presentation and you know given a nutshell of what malignant round cell tumors are i will try and elaborate a little more on the pathology side of uh, these uh, tumors and you know how uh, we best diagnose them using ancillary techniques like immunohistochemistry and certain molecular markers that we have at hands uh one second I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, like with uh, any any topic that we discuss, first let us have a little introduction of uh, uh, you know pediatric small round cell neoplasms, uh, and you know look at how they are a little different from their adult counterparts. So, you know, the in adults you generally see epithelial uh, tumors being more predominant. Whereas in pediatric uh, age group, you generally see mesodermal or hematolymphoid neoplasms uh, being more predominant. Also, uh, you know, the adult tumors are usually after a long carcinogenic exposure, whereas in pediatric counterparts, that doesn't happen. So that is usually due to an arrest in maturation of a primitive, uh, you know, normal maturing counterpart. So the most commonly encountered neoplasms in the pediatric age group are leukemias, CNS tumors, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, uh, Hodgkin lymphomas, and sarcomas. Uh, as I told you, in contrast to cells, you know, progressively acquiring mutations over time in adults, the pediatric tumors are usually caused by maturation arrest in the primitively developing precursor counterpart. Also, childhood tumors have a much lower burden of genetic aberrations. It is usually a single event, you know, example, a translocation leading to a fusion. Uh, these are also immunologically cold tumors. The immunogenicity is much lesser in these tumors. The immune response to a tumor in the body is much less in pediatric age group. It is because of these factors that WHO, the fifth edition, you know, has uh, incorporated a separate classification of pediatric tumors. This is a hierarchical classification which lists these tumors by site, category, family, and type. There is also assessment of proliferation, which is now more focused on uh, per millimeter square rather than high power field, because high power field can be a little subjective and variable. Also, uh, as far as skewed data assessments are concerned, uh, let's say, you know, in terms of age, medians are preferred more over mean. With that, you know, I would just, I, I would follow a case-based approach to just show you how we go about diagnosing some of the most common neoplasms that Dr. Juhi has already outlined. Uh, my first case is a five-year-old uh, male child, uh, and this is a, uh, you know, a cervical node. Sometimes you get these uh, uh, cases from, you know, Thai three cities in which a proper radiology workup is also not done. So what you have at hand is the tissue that has been sent to you. Of course, you can always go back and ask the clinician, but sometimes, you know, the patients are not there and sometimes the radiology is just not available. So this is the history that we had. Now, when we saw this node, you can see that these are, of course, you know, really undifferentiated small round cells. Also, what really strikes the eye is that these are very blue, you know, and there is a lot of mitosis in these uh, cells. There is uh, some micro necrosis also that you can see and a lot of atypical mitotic figures were seen. And these highly proliferating cells, you know, they give you a picture of what we call as a starry sky pattern. Now, when we did the immunohistochemistry markers, always remember IHC, uh, mostly in most of the tumors, IHC is mandatory to classify or subclassify them. Even if you're dealing with a lymphoma to even ascertain whether it is of a B cell lineage or a T cell lineage, you will have to do your preliminary IHC markers. Now, when we did the IHC in, these, in this case, CD20, as you can see, was diffusely positive. BCL2 was negative in these cells. Uh, these cells were also positive for uh, CD10 and uh, they were positive for CMIC. Now, CMIC is also available on IHC and the cutoff that we use on IHC is more than 40%. And, uh, you know, CD10 positivity and BCL2 negativity is a very pathognomic sign of uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. Also, what we see is a very high proliferating index of almost 90 to 100%. Now, whenever you see something like this, you should definitely suggest the diagnosis of a Burkitt's lymphoma. And ideally, you know, you can do MIC translocation studies in these cases. So in this case, the diagnosis were fair, you know, was fair and square. It was a case of Burkitt's lymphoma. It is characterized by translocation 814 between CMIC and IGH. Also, you know, there are different types of Burkitt lymphomas. There is the endemic type, there is the sporadic type, and there is the immune uh, immunodeficient types. So Association with EBV is present in almost 100% cases of endemic subtype, whereas in 25 to 40% cases of other subtypes. 
then you know extra nodal pre presentation often predominates you can see this in jaw or vital area abdominal mass is the usual site in cases of sporadic subtypes cns and bone marrow involvement if present it confers a poor prognosis and semic rearrangement arising in germinal center derived b cells is the primary uh, etiopathogenic uh, you know uh, causation in this case as i told you you know most of the pediatric tumors they will have one single factor which will be driving the neoplasia one oncogenic driver so in this case it is the semic rearrangement uh, arising in the germinal center derived b cells coming to case number 2 another very very interesting case this is a case of uh, you know a 13 year old male patient uh, who presented with pancytopenia and weakness and on radiology you know preliminary radiology which was done there was just a thick and bladder wall rest largely the radiology was unremarkable and when we saw uh, the bone marrow you can see that there was diffuse infiltration by extremely poorly differentiated tumor cells these also appear very very uh, you know blue and undifferentiated in morphology uh, when you when you go on the higher field you know you can at places see uh, a little you know eccentrically placed nucleus at some places a little more amount of cytoplasm especially if you see the top right corner where the zoom 40x is written you can see some of the cells will you know show a little more cytoplasm and uh, you know again this this is an extremely poorly differentiated tumor so whenever you have something like this in the marrow which is presenting with pancytopenia you have to know that this is an infiltrate you know of some sort whether it is a hematolymphoid infiltrate whether it is a uh, you know any other kind of an infiltrate so you do your basic lineage specific markers that is cd45 for lymphoid uh, ck for uh, your epithelial you know why maintain s100 for your uh, mesenchymal and neural and uh, you know cd34 and cd117 for your blasts so you know those first you need to understand what is the lineage and as i told you that in pediatrics you know the lineage is usually a mesenchymal or a hematolymphoid uh, in in these kinds of cases if this was an adult or even in childhood you know sometimes you also would like to throw in your uh, neuroendocrine markers like synaptoc chromo and cd56 so when we threw in the markers cd45 came negative so i knew that this wasn't a lymphoma cd34 and cd117 also were negative if you see cd34 it is basically just staining the blood vessels but it is negative in the tumor cells but what came positive for me was desmin so whenever desmin comes positive i know that i'm dealing with you know a myogenic differentiation and we would definitely like to throw in other set of markers including sma myo d1 myogenin and when we threw all the you know uh, the relevant markers we got myo d1 and myogenin positivity so whenever you see something like this you are very clear that your diagnosis is uh, you know this is a case of rhabdomyosarcoma embryonal is the most common type in pediatric age group but we, it is very imperative to differentiate embryonal from alveolar because these are different prognostic uh, they have different prognostic implications you can see various type of cells uh, as i told you the cells with abundant cytoplasm they are known as trap cells sometimes you can see you know little elongations of the cytoplasmic processes something which is known as tadpole cells and you know in post chemotherapeutic uh, patients you generally see a more rhabdomyoblastic differentiation something which we call as chemotherapeutic induced cyto differentiation so we have a test in fish that we do it is called a paxo pax foxo1 fusion gene product if this is present that means this is an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma if this is absent that means you are dealing with a case of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma so this is how we worked up this case now coming to another interesting case as we know that cns tumors are one of the most common tumors that we see in childhood so let's come to another uh, you know childhood tumor this was a young patient with a posterior cranial fossa midline space occupying lesion as you can clearly see in in the histology that the cells are very poorly differentiated again they are you know small round looking cells and what another very peculiar feature you can see here is that these are forming nodules if you can see you know dark blue nodules so of course whenever you have such a case you know there are you know very few cases uh, very few uh, diagnoses that you have a midline space occupying lesion in childhood the first thing you should think of is a medulloblastoma in this case so we went ahead and we did our markers uh, uh, along with the other lineage specific markers you know cd45 was negative in this case we always throw in a cd45 because lymphoma is always a diagnosis you have but uh, synaptophysin was positive nu n was also positive your neuronal markers will come positive uh, gap 1 was positive sox 11 was positive and yap 1 was also positive and you uh, you know you had a ki proliferating index which was 
again if you see the ki is highlighting a nodular type of a pattern so this was a very classical case of uh, you know a medulloblastoma a nodular medulloblastoma uh, which was shh activated and p53 we did which was staining occasional cells so we call it a p53 wild type now as we know that medulloblastomas are grade 4 tumors in the recent classifications we have different types of four major categories of medulloblastomas the wnt activated will show a very good prognosis shh activated group 3 and group 4 group 3 and group 4 are clubbed under the category of non wnt and non shh activated you have very certain uh, you know when we do molecular workup in these cases you see monosomy 6 and wnt ptch1 losses are very peculiar of shh activated tumors again mic can be amplified in a medulloblastoma and you can see chromosomal 7 abnormalities which are very specific for non wnt and non shh group so i have just given in a nutshell you know uh, this table which will help uh, everybody know that uh, you know what are the ihc findings in different categories so if you see you know uh, a gap one with yap one positivity is very specific for shh subtype in wnt subtype you will see yap one positivity but gap one will be negative also beta catenin nuclear positivity is typical of wnt as we know it is a beta catenin pathway uh, so you know this table is very good it will show you in a nutshell how you can predict what category of medulloblastoma your particular tumor is let us see another case a very very interesting case uh, this was a case of a 7 months old uh, you know child uh, dr juhi remembers this we had uh, long discussions on this case this was an abdominal mass originating and or you know involving the liver and if you can see the morphology of this tumor it was very characteristically again you know it's a small round cell neoplasm you have very typical uh, you know round blue nuclei but you can see that this has a rhabdoid morphology and uh, you know when you when you deal with this uh, you know there are different differential diagnoses that come into your mind and uh, you know one of them is of course um, uh, a rhabdoid tumor of some sort rhabdomyosarcoma uh, hepatoblastoma you know we, you know it can show you different subtypes it can look epithelial uh, it can show fetal subtype and morphology it can look anything so this was a very typically challenging case for us because it was important for us to label it properly you know because treatment would depend on that and when we did the ihc markers pan ck came positive sal4 was also positive a very important thing to note is that while glipican 3 was focally positive hsa was negative you know and uh, we also did a beta catenin which was negative now because sal4 is positive that doesn't make it a germ cell tumor because glipican 3 is positive it doesn't make it a hepatocytic differentiation tilting towards hepatoblastoma a hepatoblastoma will show you positivity for beta catenin and hsa usually but this tumor was a little different and the clinching ihc marker in this case was ini1 uh, which was lost so uh, with this you know my diagnosis was pretty much clear this was a case of malignant rhabdoid tumor of liver now a very pathognomic finding in this case is ini1 and smark b1 loss also as they become poorly differentiated and more rhabdoid in morphology we see sal4 and afp upregulation which was seen in this case that is why sal4 protein expression was also seen i would also like to tell that erstwhile you know people used to think that there is a subset of uh, hepatoblastoma which shows loss of smark b1 or ini1 as per the latest uh, thought process these are all actually malignant rhabdoid tumors only so if you see a ini1 loss in such a tumor you should call it a malignant rhabdoid tumor now let us see the final case and this was a case of a 5 year old male child uh, who presented with soft tissue gluteal mass and there were lung lesions if uh, everybody was listening to dr juhi's talk you know a small round cell neoplasm which shows propensity to be in the lung you know or show lung deposits you should definitely think clinically of a particular tumor let us see what this turned out to be again if you see the morphology extremely poorly differentiated small round blue cells what really strikes the eye is a perithelomatous pattern these tumors you know have a tendency to wrap around the blood vessels they also have a tendency to form rosettes and if you see the chromatin it was stippled chromatin and when we threw in the relevant ihc markers cd45 was negative ck was negative synaptophysin was focally positive vimentin was positive cd99 was positive and we threw in a marker which is extremely specific for these type of tumors that is nkx 2.2 so this was nothing but Uh, a case of uh, ewing sarcoma or primitive neuroectodermal tumor 
now when we you know the, the pathognomonic finding in these types of tumors is that they involve fusion they are usually related with fusion products of uh, you know fet uh, group of genes in which most commonly it is the ewsr1 gene which is involved so the most common translocation that you see is 1122 which involves the ewsr1 and the fly1 fusion protein the second most common translocation you see is the translocation 2122 Uh, which is which results in EWSR1 ERG fusion you can see other rare fusions involving the ETV1 ETV4 and also uh, the FUS uh, uh, gene so uh, uh, an important thing i would like to tell you is that a lot of people use fly1 as an ic marker it is a very non specific marker you can see it in a lot of other tumors so you should be a little careful before you know labeling something without doing nkx 2.2 uh, so with that i would just like to conclude my talk these are you know just some pictures from departmental activities that we do and uh, you know we look forward to the international childhood cancer day and i would like to thank dr juhi dr monica and dr amit for giving me this opportunity you know we can take the questions as and when they arise okay uh, so uh, we have a question uh, what are the prerequisites of a bio for a biopsy for an effective diagnosis if fnac is fnac sufficient or a true cut biopsy is to be done fnac is never sufficient for making a conclusive diagnosis because as i told you we would definitely need to run a lot of ihc markers also for these uh, undifferentiated tumors plus even for molecular studies you would need a good amount of tumor tissue so a good representative biopsy you know which has an adequate number of tumor cells which is your ideal core biopsy that uh, the clinicians take is is the way to you know look at so any specific number of cores that are supposed to be taken when doing no a even a to be honest even a single core you know with sufficient amount of tumor tissue will usually clinch the diagnosis okay so it you is just need to make sure that you know we we usually expect about 10 to 12 markers in this case so multiple cores are beneficial you know tissue exhaustion especially the problem is patient patients these days go for shopping not just in clinics even in pathology you know your block <laughs> is likely to land up with other pathologists they will also want to run markers right from the beginning so that is where you you know a good amount of tissue is is probably needed but otherwise a good core biopsy is usually sufficient okay so we are that is okay for doing is and also to require that in today's day and age when you have molecular playing such an important role we need more tissue so yeah one is sufficient but you should get as much as possible and yeah fnc in today's day and age i think it's a outdated test completely agree Uh, so next question is should it be collected in formalin and what special test should the tissue be sent for so uh, yes it should be collected in formalin uh, and uh, the special test is firstly you know histopathology is the the basis and we need to start from uh, that then we need to run the ihc markers and based on the diagnosis that you arrive you know the relevant molecular workup will be done if it is an evings we would you know uh want to suggest a ewsr1 fly1 uh, fusion if it is let's say if it is a burkitt's lymphoma we would like to suggest a mic uh, you know mix studies and those so it all depends upon it's a step wise process we don't jump any of the steps so based on your histopath and ihc workup the further testing is advised either through fish or through moleculars okay so basically the next question was cost of such tests so basically you decide on your premium uh, premium uh, i mean first test that what other molecular uh, panel you need i mean the ic panel you need so you have select you go selected on that yeah so you see um, you know we do try to reduce the cost as much as possible we have ihc counterparts of uh, a lot of markers that are done in moleculars for example cmic we even use them for high grade b cell lymphomas mum1 is a very good marker for your you know large b cell lymphomas which are irf or rearranged but you know to be honest in in today's day and age where you know uh, the patient anyways you know the, the, a correct diagnosis imp is imperative i want i always suggest the patients to do a full workup because if there is any lapse in the diagnosis you know the implication of a wrong treatment based on a wrong diagnosis is very heavy so more, we we have reduced the cost even today sequencing test cost in thousands so i think cost as of today in certain cases yes it is a it is a factor we do try to give as much of uh, a detailed diagnosis as we can but you should definitely go for the entire workup as much as possible it will be in thousands it will not go in lakhs okay so i hope this question is answered uh i think no more questions sure. so uh 
Dr. Amit, will you please take yeah. the, Dr. Amit Kumar is yeah, the oncologist in HCG Kulaba and is also going to HCG Borivili. Over to you, Dr. Amit. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Monica. So uh, now, uh, after this elaborate uh, presentation by Dr. Jitin, Dr. Kunal, so we'll just go through two cases uh, that uh, maybe are not so complicated ones. So just for the viewers, uh, we'll go through these cases and we'll uh, put uh, some questions to the uh, panelists. So I just say my speech. Is visible? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, this is your plan uh, discussion on uh, two cases uh, of brown cell tumors. And panelist are Dr. Juhi Shah, who is a period oncologist with uh, uh, Otis Hospital Mullen. Dr. Kunal Sarma, who is a, a, a director, a, a director and uh, uh, head at the uh, SRI Laboratory in Mumbai. Dr. Monica Bhagat, who is a pediatric surgeon uh, with SRI hospitals and uh, different uh, many hospitals and SCG also. So uh, we'll move ahead, move ahead with the cases. The first case is Master MK, a one and a half year old male child, patient of Vasi, second by birth order, born of non consequence marriage at term, birth with 2.5 feet, no NFCT, vaccinated till date, and no female concerns. So uh, the child is present with a fever of uh, one month uh, that was high grade intermittent with abdominal lump that was detected by parents 20 days back uh, accidentally on while uh, uh, giving a bath. Uh, the child had poor appetite and weight loss of approximate one kg over last one and a half months and uh, had uh, four to five episodes of convulsions in the last one month and last episode was BP4 presentation to us and uh, the child was loaded with penitoin and valproate and was put on oral valproin. So the child had uh, uh, the child underwent a USG at local hospital that showed a lip suprarenal mass that was encasing vessels and was has been seen within the mask. So uh, at the presentation to us, the child had uh, uh, a vital of BP of 154 and 94, heart rate of 120 and respiratory 30. He was sick looking, emaciated. Pipples, GCS was uh, E4, M4, B2, and pipples were 2 to 3 mm, equally reactive, well inside a reactive light. On examination, uh, there was a palpable mass in left upper abdomen that had a consistency and chest, chest and CVS were NAD. So uh, we did a CT scan uh, for because the child had uh, seizures. There was area of pressionic edema in both cerebral hemispheres, likely PRS, that is uh, a posterior reversible intervalopathy syndrome. It is a CT abdomen that showed a lip suprarenal mass in casing aorta and lip vessels with calcification within surgery of clear neuroblastoma. In labs, the child had normal back chemistry with the normal CBC. Ferritin was raised. We did this um, tumor markers based on suspicion of neuroblastoma. Ferritin was normal with 41.95 nanogram per ml. LDS is quite high, that's 65. And urinary BMA, that was done spot urinary BMA, that showed 90.54 milligram per gram of ferritin. We did the HPR of the uh, mass, uh, image guided, that was suprarenal mass biopsy. It showed many down cell tumor that was poorly differentiated. Swarini stroma, stroma was poor uh, with intermediate MKI and histopathology was unfavorable as uh, for IAPC classification. ISG was positive for chromogradin and streptopycin and negative for uh, AE1, AE3, WT1, MKX 2.2 and Desmet. So this was given as neuroblastoma poorly differentiated. We did bone marrow, expression biopsy, both were uninvolved. So my question to Dr. Kunal Sarma, what are different morphological types of neuroblastoma and how do we classify the histology as favorable? So Dr. Amit, so the different morphological types of neuroblastoma have seen, you know, a change from the earlier Shimada classification. Uh, you know, the current classification differentiates them into the differentiating, then, you know, uh, the poorly differentiated and the undifferentiated types. So they are basically based upon whether, you know, the, that is the percentage of differentiating neuroblasts. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in a differentiated tumor, it will usually be more than 5% and you will see a good amount of background neuropil. In a poorly differentiated tumor, the neuropil will be present, but the differentiating neuroblast will be less than 5%. And in an undifferentiated tumor, you will see, you will not see neuropil and they will look very, very poorly differentiated. And, you know, there'll be small round blue cell looking and you will not be able to typify, you know, based on morphology. Now, uh, this is 
just i'm talking about the neuroblastoma of course there is ganglion neuroma ganglion neuroblastoma in which you see a schwannian stroma they also say that if you are seeing a schwannian stroma in a neuroblastoma it should be less than 50% of the total stroma that you see now okay. uh, as far as the uh, unfavorable and favorable histology is concerned you know an undifferentiated uh, looking morphology at any age is an unfavorable histology then a poorly differentiated uh, type of a morphology more than 1.5 years is you know an unfavorable histology then we also look at something which is known as a mitosis karyorectic index now mitosis karyorectic index could be low intermediate or high a low is less than 2% 2 to 4% is intermediate and uh, more than 4% is high so again high you know at any age is is a problem also i would like to say uh, any histology more than 5 years of age is again you know an unfavorable histology even if you are seeing differentiated neuroblasts so uh, and again uh, uh, an intermediate mitotic karyorectic index more than 1.5 years becomes an unfavorable histology and anything which did not fall in these categories is your favorable histology thank you uh, so uh, uh, we did a staging pct so this was a, a mass that was there in uh, uh, left suprarenal gland extending from d10 to alpha vertebra that was 10.2 into 10 to 11 cm with sv max of with high sv max and it was compressing uh, and infiltrating a left kidney and displacing the aorta and uh, displacing it and bowel loops so muscles uh, crossing midline and uh, it was circling the ivc and aorta and its branches and there was low grade epigeptic uh, in the uh, supraglial nodes and metacranial nodes so my question to dr jyoti so how do we stage this disease at this point yeah so this is like a very borderline case dr amit but as you see you have mentioned the age as 18 months but the presentation was since one month the complaints was since one month so at presentation the child is 17 months yeah and uh, distant lymph nodes are involved so it is stage m as you said the supraclavicular and mediastinal nodes are involved so this is a infantile stage m because of the nodes and as you know from the pathology it's a unfavorable histology Oh. So, uh, we did the MLPA testing in this child, and we found that there was a anemic amplification in this case. So, uh, this next question is Dr. Kunal. So, what is MLPA and the role of marker studies in neuroblastoma, and how do you interpret this report in correlation with this patient? So, uh, you know, uh, MLPA is, as you have already told, multiplex ligation, you know, probe amplification. Uh, this is a type of a, basically, it's a, it's a, it's an extended PCR technology only. In PCR, to put it very simply, what would happen is that there would be exponential increase in the uh, genetic material. In okay. MLPA, what happens is that uh, it is basically, it is probes which are amplified. so these probes are hybridized to the genetic material that is your dna and then they are you know they are they are amplified so the advantage of a mlpa is that many a times you know uh, either extremely large or you know even or or sometimes extremely small that is fragmented deletions copy number variations these are the kinds which are very nicely picked up by mlpa uh, even in adult cases you know sometimes brakas which are not usually picked up by sequencing we use this technology to detect these now as we know that you know neuroblastoma has uh, different uh, molecular uh, uh, you know uh, uh, pathogenesis associated with it nmic is one it also depends upon the ploidy you know uh, wh whether it is diploid or whether it is triploid and detection in a triploid is low risk detection in a diploid is you know high risk and there are other types of uh, molecular implications also like there is alk which can be detected there is atrx which can be detected so these these have prognostic implications in a case of neuroblastoma so it is very important that when your clinician is looking at these you know you should definitely provide them with uh, the molecular markup of the disease because enmic uh, you know dr juhi would probably be better able to answer is probably associated with poorer prognosis you know some of the others can show better prognosis ऑफ 
so i mean uh, you know the cut offs are different on different technologies okay. they are also okay. based on the kit that you use so basically okay. based on that it differs it's it's not a sacrosanct you know okay. in fish it it comes as something different we have signals that we detect you know through fish probes and in okay. mlp it is different through ngs it is different okay so uh, next one dr dv so uh, we have got this reports in this patient and uh, then uh, how do we stratify this uh, patient as per risk uh, for, for management like this stratification and what would be the line of management for this child yeah so dr amit till we did not have the mlp report it was uh, an infantile stage m uh, un, uh, with a poorly differentiated neuroblastoma which would otherwise yeah. fall into an intermediate risk as you can see uh, according to the inrg classification now with the mlp report of nmic being amplified and i also like to highlight that whenever nmic is amplified you will also see a 1p loss in 7q gain Okay. These are segmental chromosomal aberrations which go hand in hand with NMIC, and therefore they are not that useful. As you can see, you will not see them this in the, in this chart. But eleven yeah. Q loss is a independent poor prognostic factor. And if you see in this case, so this falls in stage M, less than eighteen months with NMIC amplification. This would be a high risk neuroblastoma. Yeah, so, and uh, as we know, the lines of management for high risk neuroblastoma would be a multimodality treatment. So we need to give induction chemotherapy to this child uh, and uh, need a local therapy. The purpose of induction is chemotherapy and surgery is to bring down the macroscopic or the amount of tumor in the body by chemo and then followed by surgery. And then we consolidate this in order to. uh decrease the tumor burden further with a autologous uh, bmt and radiation therapy to the primary and the residual site so this is to eradicate yeah. residual disease and then we have post consolidation measures for the minimal residual disease or the mrd where we use immunotherapy which is dinotuximab with gm csf and isotretinoin okay. so uh so uh, next question to dr morinda so uh, this is a key of neuroblastoma so what is the difference in the surgical approach the neuroblastoma as compared to other outside tumors okay. so for a uh, surgical uh, for other tumors basically when when for any of the tumor when we are excising basically we need to have clear margins and to excise is completely and uh, most of the round cell tumors they are chemo sensitive they are radio sensitive so in case it is not in, if any round cell tumor in any of the round cell tumors are not operative upfront we can give chemotherapy and operate for neuroblastoma when you when uh, we, we give chemo chemotherapy there's tendency that it matures so in neuroblastoma it is not important to resect it completely uh, with margins which uh, obviously we cannot get so we can basically do uh, the surgeries in neuroblastoma are like gross total resection so that means we are removing all the disease which is seen or we if there's some disease which is like uh, located at a difficult uh, location like it is just stuck to aorta we can take it out so or any difficult location uh, location we can leave that behind and th that would be called as minimal residual disease or more than 90% of the resection then we have less than or more than 50% resection and it is not important to re remove tumor in toto we can basically break break and then uh, we can act basically di uh, dis dissect it off so it is not that we need to re remove it in one chunk we can re uh, dissect it off uh, the renal vessel aorta wherever the, whatever the structures are underlying so uh, that is the difference between uh, operating neuroblastoma and the other tumors okay so monica so uh the more next case so a uh, second was a case of 5 year old boy presented with right sided neck swelling gradually increasing in size last over last two months initially was noticed on right side of neck and gradually improved with left side left side of the neck no b symptoms on inquiry there history of noisy breathing On examination, weight was seven point seven two point eight kg and height of hundred eleven centimeter and vital signal. So a uh, lymph node on right side, the cervical lymph node almost four centimeter by three centimeter and left hand uh, side lymph node was two centimeter by two point five centimeter and there was bilateral axillary nodes of one point five centimeter. Oral cavity there was bilateral tonsil enlargement plus volder ring involvement and mass was seen covering right tonsillar fossa almost completely. Per abdomen. There was uh, no uh, hepatosplenomegaly and respiratory system was normal. So, investigations 
we did cbc mdc and ps smear that was normal uh, ldh was found to be uh, normal of 166 iu per liter and pt I, uh, aptt inr was normal and all the biomarkers were negative the blood group was uh, known as cx was cxr was normal so the question of johisa yeah what would you consider it as differential at this point and how do you proceed for that one so uh, this is a child which has a very short history of 2 months with a significant and bulky lymphadenopathy so i would consider malignancy up front in this case and my differentials would be a high grade lymphoma a uh, non hodgkins lymphoma is something i would like to keep on the top with the burkitts and dlbcl being the most common but also hodgkins lymphoma is something i would consider for the nodular lymphocytic predominant uh, hodgkins lymphoma because they tend to involve the valdez ring and the cervical area and uh, as we already discussed that fnsc has no role and uh, we should go for co biopsy but in this case especially in lymphomas we would urge that please go for an excisional nodal biopsy because in the entire structure of the lymph node is very important for the pathologist i'm sure dr kunal will agree and even if it's a hodgkins then these reed sternberg cells are so difficult to find and they are located at the center of the lymph node so please as as much as possible go for an excisional lymph node biopsy so uh right so that's a little battery first done and throat size pattern uh thread to a very bucket coma so question of kunal sai kunal sharma is how to differentiate a different genetic anatels like the uh, bucket lymphoma dlbcl alcl and uh, lymphocytic lymphoma based on morphology and isc and how does cytology the molecular studies help in diagnosis of anatels sure so dr amit first of all i would like to you know reiterate what dr juhi said she was so right in saying that these are cases in which excisional node biopsies help a lot you can see Uh, Hodgkin like cells in a lot of non Hodgkin lymphomas as well you can see architectural distortions that you need to evaluate which can very easily be missed in a core biopsy you know and sometimes you know you can see partial node involvements and if you get a core biopsy from an area where the where the node wasn't involved you will see a reactive node and you know actually the node was partially involved so first i would like to start with that as far as differentiating based on morphology and ics are concerned this is a very it's a it's it's a composite yeah. art you know there are different uh, there are, there are differences it's very difficult to elaborate yeah. all of them but i'll try and you know do it in the most concise manner you see you, your uh, effacement of the node could be nodular or it could be diffuse and there are different lymphomas you know nodular as dr juhi just said you can have nodular lymphocyte predominant hodgkins lymphoma in in a more adult population you can probably have something which is a follicular lymphoma where you know nodular sclerosis hodgkins can also be nodular in pattern diffuse is what you usually see in non hodgkin lymphomas which could be dlbcls which could be t cell lymphomas which could be your burkitts lymphoma as i told you burkitts has a very beautiful starry sky pattern you can see highly proliferating small cells with a little basophilic cytoplasm they are all and and you know whenever you see a non hodgkin lymphoma it is imperative to know whether it is a b cell or a t cell you yeah. throw in your b cell markers which are your cd20 pax5 cd19 cd79a and in in a t cell lymphoma usually what we do is a pan t cell panel uh, and it is it is you know a loss in one of the pan t cell markers is very significant it usually tells you that you are dealing with a case of t cell lymphoma there are specific markers for specific t cell lymphomas your nk t cell lymphomas will be positive for 56 and eberish uh, your dl bcls in childhood are usually the irf4 rearranged they will be positive for mum1 uh, you know the hodgkins has a very typical immunophenotype it shows 30 positivity pax5 is dim as compared to your neighboring b cells it will be positive for ebv it will be positive for mum1 and uh, you know semic positivity i ki 20 positivity bcl2 lost cd10 positivity is a pathognomonic immunohistochemistry finding in a case of burkitt's lymphoma coming to cytogenetics and molecular studies they can help you a lot in a case of burkitt's mic translocation studies are are advised even in case of non hodgkin's lymphomas many a times you know in there is sometimes confusion in t cell lymphoproliferative disorders whether it is actually a lymphomatous involvement or whether it is some sort of you know an autoimmune process or something else you can have these t cell lymphoproliferations which can be you know sometimes even cd7 losses can be seen in them and they can be very tricky so you go for t cell receptor gene rearrangement studies in these cases 
let's say a DLBCL with uh, IRFO rearrangement, you go for rearrangements uh, for IRFO. You know, so cytogenetic molecule studies help. It's a composite approach towards diagnosis from histopath to molecular studies. Okay. Uh, so, uh, with this uh, cervical lymphoid STM biopsy, uh, it came out to be a case of uh, a down two cell tumor, banded nucleus comprising of large size round cell emerging carrying the seeds and showing markedly high matter activity and haploidic necrosis. IST, uh, it was positive for C45, C20, C6, C10, CL6, and ETRH, and KS index was 95 98%. And they were negative for CD3, BCL2, and TDT, and second day one. So it was such a perfect lymphoma. So, uh, and we did this uh, uh, CD thorax, abdomen, pelvis. This was a bulky uh, cervical lymph node, right for the left, with exit lymphoid positive bordering were enlarged. So, PM, uh, CSF were negative. So, question Dr. Juhi, sir. So, at this point, how do we stage the CG? And what are the challenges that you can anticipate? It? this child at the time of presentation, how do you manage them? Yeah, so Dr. Amit, uh, so we generally stage non-Hodgkin's lymphoma using the modified Murphy's uh, classification, also known as the St. Jude staging system. So in this patient, you can see three uh, lymph node groups are involved, the Valdez ring, the cervical region, and the axillary nodes. But they are all above the diaphragm. So this would be a stage two, where two or more nodal areas on the same side of diaphragm are involved. Also, uh, since it's a Burkitt's lymphoma, uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, since now this has been diagnosed as a Burkitt's lymphoma, we also have grouping uh, by the uh, FAB LMB classification where this would fall into group B. So now the uh, newer, initially we used to say that uh, group A is completely resected stage 1, 2. Group B would yeah. be LDH less than 500. But now in the inter trial, what we say is, Whatever is less than or equal to two times the uh, normal or the upper limit in your lab is taken as uh, a low risk disease, whereas uh, LDH more than two times the upper limit would become high risk. So this would fall since the LDH was normal according to a lab. This would fall into group B. And if you're classifying it as the uh, as per the BFM uh, NHL group, then this would be a R2. So okay. the complete diagnosis would be a stage two group B or R2. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, yeah. So the as we know that these are highly uh, aggressive tumors, malignant tumors, and they have a, a tendency to lie, spontaneous lice, or uh, once we start treatment, they would have tumor lysis. Now, uh, in general, in this, particularly in my case, since the LDH is low, it is only limit. It's a limited disease, only a stage two disease. I do not expect so much of tumor lysis syndrome, uh, but you should be very careful in these cases uh, for tumor lysis. So most importantly is before you start any treatment, you should start hydration at three liters per meter square. That is around, uh, you know, two times the maintenance uh, per meter square per day should hydrate the child well. You should start anti-TLS measures in the form of hypouricemic agents like aliprinol and phosphate binders. Monitor the intake output and the blood pressure. And for the tumor lysis, you need to monitor the RFTs and the electrolytes. And in all these cases, since we do not want the child to land up into a, a massive tumor lysis, we always start with a lesser intensive chemotherapy, like a short preface cough, which involves cyclophosphamide, vincristine, and prednisolone, which is a seven-day therapy. The purpose of giving this is we want to give a non-intensive therapy so that it would take care of the symptoms because this child uh, is actually presented with bulky cervical lymphadenopathy and he had orthopnea and snoring. So we wanted to give some immediate treatment but not have tumor lysis in this child. So you can give a non-intensive COP-like regimen and it also it would help because it would not suppress the uh, child. They would, the, there would be no cytopenias and some non-myelosuppressive therapy. Uh so uh, how do we manage this case right, uh, at this point of time? And uh, like when we uh, do the response evaluation with lymphoma, how do you differ from the other and for a long term outcome? Okay. So uh, this case, like this is a limited stage two disease. You could use, like we have standard of care protocols available, including the LMP fab where you would use uh, the HDMT space protocol or the BFM protocol, both of them use HDMTX. 
uh, and it's, this is something we do indigenously in our country where we have you know adaptive therapies where we know this is a stage two disease and if there are socioeconomic concerns if admission is not possible funds are an issue serum mtx levels monitoring is an issue we can actually go with a non hdmtx based therapy which is the mcp842 protocol which is a indigenous protocol an old protocol which has alternating cycles with multi agent chemotherapy which are non cross resistant and it would give similar outcomes and then the assessment as you said that in in burkits it could be a ct based or a pet ct based imaging now and all like we have role of pet ct in hodgkins similarly we have more and more role of pet coming up in non hodgkins especially in burkits where would we would do a pet ct and we have a dual scoring system where we would see if there is after two cycles we would reassess if there is any residual disease and if there is any activity if we have pet uh, if you are doing a pet and if there is any residual at the end of two cycles then it then it indicates that this uh, patient is not responding to the treatment or not effectively responding to the treatment we are giving and in these cases it would uh, and this is an indication for augmenting the therapy and uh, in this case i mean burkitts in general has a very good prognosis and since this is a stage 2 group b this has a excellent prognosis 90 to 100% survival okay uh, so one more question Like, yeah. uh, what is the use of what is the role of reductimab in uh, this macrobacillus lymphoma? Yeah. So, as if you could go back, I had staged due to the new interretax classification. So, the role of reductimab comes in this group B high risk, where the LDH is more than two times stage three, stage four, or uh, group C, where you have bone marrow involvement with twenty five percent blas and CNS involvement. So, uh, the interretax found that. reuse of rituximab will give better outcomes also there are more and more trials going on where in stage 1 or stage 2 where you would give chemotherapy can we just give rituximab or something which has rituximab but no anthracycline so we want to yeah. give a very small short course of chemotherapy not give any side effects to the child because anyways these children do well why give them a future cardiotoxicity yes yeah. the role is coming in both the stages actually Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Juki and Dr. Uh, Kunal and Dr. Monica. So uh, these are two cases that uh, we discuss in brief. So uh, thank you, thanks a lot. So uh, handing over Dr. Monica. Yeah, I think Dr. Ami, there are few comments in the box, chat box. Sure. So there were few questions which I have taken. Okay. Okay. Want me to answer it again? I could. So there was a question that. Uh, is splenectomy a pre prerequisite to decrease disease burden in hodgkins lymphoma so the answer is no so like we have lymph nodal involvement as i said we have uh, the lymph the spleen involvement in a hodgkin is actually extra nodal involvement which is taken as a s and hodgkin lymphoma is completely curable with chemotherapy and uh, so the only indication of surgery in a lymphoma is in a nlphl where if you have like a cervical node or a valdea ring or one which you have been able to completely excise and make it a stage 1 then you can just observe this child and there is no need for further treatment okay so there is one question how has a new classification neuroblastoma from unfavorable and unfavorable to differentiation poorly differentiated change the management So, what is the question, Doctor? Me? Uh, how has new classification of neuroblastoma from favorable and unfavorable to differentiation to poorly differentiated has changed the management? So, as Doctor Kunal had pointed, if you have a poorly differentiated tumor and which is you know uh, would generally and is classified as unfavorable, then you would treat it as a high risk. And even uh, there are certain markers like if you have a poorly differentiated in an infantile which is an intermediate it would also warrant more treatment that yeah. is instead of four cycles you would give eight cycles if eight possible cycles. you would give rt so it would you would treat it as as a high risk neuroblastoma uh, maybe without a bmt uh, there is uh, one question uh, dated to dr uh, kunal So is interface fist required every time or MLP is enough? No, no MLP MLP is enough. Any one technology is uh, fine. The only difference is you know uh, TAD turnaround times are definitely different for the, all these technologies. 
so that is one also what i would like to highlight is that you know protein expression stays at the center of all of it so like we have done for cmic and translocations you know uh, nmic right now we don't use it practically quite a lot but there are studies which are showing that nmic ihc you know along with uh, fish can can you know that that can suffice most of these cases so that's that's the difference you know turnaround time differs but any one technology is fine okay yeah i think we should wind up it's if there are yeah, no yeah, further yeah. questions yeah there is no further questions i i yeah. think I, it is all just one comment on the line which is like surgery for neuroblastoma is always distal sparing and organs such as kidneys are to be supported yeah. basically it is true so this is supposed to be followed but sometimes there is a tumor which is basically badly encasing renal vessels or ureter is gone so and kidney is shrunken so those are the conditions where obviously you cannot save kidney and fact, if tension is uncontrollable so these are the fact, things where we cannot say that we discussed now yeah. shall underwent a nephrectomy oh. yes so so, so basically this was yes. quite a big part that was involved in all the kidney and fact uh, this was yeah. not to save so basically to preserve but yes some conditions clinically situation we cannot uh, to anything yeah so thank you everyone it was actually a nice session so i had basically asked for a topic so next topic is like practical problems in treating leukemias pathologist role in proper monitoring so <laughs> this would be for next month so i'll reach out uh, you all again and sure. thank you for this time thank you all uh, joined us thank you thank you thank, thank you, you.